Hello, I'm Jim Burnett. This is the fifth program in our series, NASA and Aeronautics. It is the summer of 1969, a summer that is best known for Neil Armstrong's legendary stroll on the moon. However, during this period, NASA is continually striving for overall improvement in the field of aviation. In this program, we watch several film clips that illustrate NASA's activities in aeronautical research, reducing the noise level on jet engines, developing planes that can travel faster, working on improving the safety of various aircraft. These are all topics which we cover in this episode. However, before focusing on these subjects, we turn our attention one more time to the X-15. In this first film, we watch as NASA terminates the work on this project. Then the second film we see examines the problem of weak turbulence and how NASA works in this area. This is NASA test pilot Bill Dana. It was he who flew the rocket-powered X-15 for the last time. The X-15 is now being prepared to move alongside the Wright Brothers plane and the Spirit of St. Louis in the Smithsonian Institution, Washington, D.C. For nine years, this sleek black aircraft has made flight after flight. Many times skimming along the fringes of space. Tests that prove that man could fly at hypersonic speeds and adjust to control systems used routinely on today's manned spacecraft. 199 times the X-15 was dropped in midair. Top speed, 4,500 miles per hour. Maximum altitude, over 67 miles. The aeronautics and space data returned by the X-15 went far beyond original design limits, earning it a place in history with other pioneering aircraft. What you are seeing are vortices, tornado-like patterns of air generated by planes, made visible here by colored smoke as the plane flies by. They present a problem to other aircraft, especially during takeoff and landing. Weak turbulence has been recognized as a hazard for many years. The problem has become more critical recently as larger and more powerful jet planes take to the air. The danger of the swirling air masses is multiplied because they occur unexpectedly and the pilot of an airplane cannot see them. This animation shows the cylindrical masses of air as they whip around the wingtips of a plane causing vortices. These Federal Aviation Agency wind tunnel tests further illustrate the way a vortex forms. How violent the turbulence will be depends on the plane's weight and speed. The air turbulence caused by vortices has been observed lingering on for several minutes after a plane passes by. NASA is approaching the problem first by trying to better understand the vortex phenomenon. At the Flight Research Center in California, a plane trails a larger aircraft to experience and study vortices in flight. Other engineers are looking at various wing designs and modifications in an attempt to break up the vortices before they occur. Marshall Space Flight Center researchers in Huntsville, Alabama are trying to adapt laser technology to remotely monitor the invisible vortices in terminal areas. The laser provides a radar-like system that sweeps the sky and can see where the whirlwinds of air are located. The vortex churned up by this airplane as it flies by a smoke tower is spotted by laser and becomes a readable pattern that engineers can measure and record. The results of these various research programs are expected to provide a better understanding of vortices and make airport operations safer and more effective. Now in this next film, we get a look at the efforts NASA has made in order to reduce the noise level of jet engines. This four minute clip made in the fall of 1970 is a good indication of how much progress NASA has made in dealing with this problem.
These sounds of our jet age are familiar ones. To people living near airports where the big jets take off and land, the noise levels range from annoying to nearly intolerable. NASA has been working on the problem of reducing jet aircraft noise for several years. Solutions, while not easy, are inevitable. Quiet jet engine research is being conducted jointly by government industry teams. For example, the Boeing company under contract to NASA is looking at two separate ways to reduce noise levels. Since the high frequency whine generated by a jet engine is the most irritating, studies have been concentrated in this area. A standard production engine being used today looks like this. Here are engines treated with 338 square feet of sound absorbing linings. Before flight testing the acoustically treated engines, 20 microphones were strategically placed along a runway. Vans housed the recording and test equipment. Because it was important to measure the exact distances between the microphones and the plane, radar tracked and precisely located the plane's position. In addition to the scientific measurements, these people gave their subjective reactions to the noise. All the tests were carried out under predefined weather conditions, and a meteorological station located in the center of the acoustic range made continuous weather measurements. Data was also taken over water, where atmospheric conditions were more stable. For the level flyby acoustic tests, the airplane was flown at 400 feet altitude at 160 knots. Sound is measured in decibels of perceived noise. Using the acoustically treated engines, the perceived noise was reduced by over 95%. Listen to the difference as first the plane with the untreated engines flies over. Now the acoustically treated plane. As expected, this noise reduction was not made without some penalties. For instance, there is an increase in total operating cost and a reduction in distance a plane can travel without being refueled. Efforts to reduce these and other penalties are continuing through additional research and development. Another engine noise modification program carried out by Boeing for NASA was the Sonic Throat Inlet Study. This diaphragm-like device built into a jet engine regulates the flow of air. For approach and landing, the minimum flow position. When noise suppression is not needed, such as at cruising altitudes, the maximum flow is used. Now let's see how effective it is. While these studies are going on to improve existing engines, the Lewis Research Center in Cleveland is trying to build a completely new engine, an engine designed to be quiet. Right now, they are testing various parts of jet engines to see which ones cause noise. Once they know this, a quieter engine can be built. Quieter jet engines, new designs tested in the next two years will make jet aircraft of the future much more tolerable. The next film is about the supercritical wing. This is a concept which NASA hopes will improve flying efficiency when a plane is traveling at high speeds. After that, we turn our attention to a film, Earth Resources Survey. This is NASA test pilot Tom McMurtry preparing for another flight in a plane with a newly designed wing shape. Called the supercritical wing, this promising new concept from aeronautical research should substantially lower operating costs and increase the flying efficiency of future jet transports. Conventional jet aircraft wings become inefficient at about 530 miles per hour when shock waves build up increasing resistance to the air. The new design alters the flow of air over the top of the wing, allowing the aircraft to fly faster, more smoothly, and at lower operating costs. The supercritical wing, 
an effort to improve and refine future jet transports through new aeronautical concepts. These men are preparing to fly an Earth Resources Survey mission. Their target, the island of Jamaica. Recently, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization and the government of Jamaica asked NASA to record photographic and thermal images of the Jamaican island. NASA is presently using planes to check out sensing equipment that will one day fly on unmanned Earth Resources satellites and the manned orbiting Skylab. For the surveys of Jamaica, flights were made over the island and coastal waters at varying altitudes from 3,000 to 25,000 feet. On board, infrared cameras and sensors recorded photographic and thermal images as they passed over various land and water masses. Every object on land or sea emits visible light, heat, and other radiation which can be measured. From surveys like this, much can be learned about the condition of crops, forests, mineral deposits, and water resources. Some 15 field teams moved about the island to be in position when the aircraft flew over. This correlation from above and below gives scientists what they call ground truth. Although it has an average rainfall of 200 inches yearly, much of the mountain river water never reaches Jamaica's cities. Suspected are submarine springs that carry a portion of the water offshore into the ocean. Mr. John Williams of the Jamaica Geological Survey came to the Manned Spacecraft Center, Houston, to review data resulting from the 10 flights. What we particularly wanted to do was to locate offshore discharge of groundwater. There's a very large uh, submarine discharge of groundwater around the coast in the limestone areas. Uh, but for various reasons, it's difficult to pick up. And we've seen uh, from work in other parts of the world that it can be done by remote sensing. The other objective was to pick up water-bearing structures in the limestone. Some work was done on this. Uh, from photography taken by the Apollo 9 mission, and that is where we got the idea from. Earth Resources Surveys. During the months ahead, officials from Jamaica and the United Nations will be reviewing results of the 17,000 photographs and complex sensing data. It is the autumn of 1971, and NASA's aeronautical engineers are at it again. In this first short film, they are working on the fastest plane in the world, the YF-12. The second film, produced a few months later, shows NASA again tangling with the problem of jet vortices. This is NASA test pilot Donald L. Malik as he prepares to fly the YF-12, a sleek black plane capable of flying 2,000 miles per hour cruising at altitudes of 15 miles above the Earth. It is considered to be the fastest plane in the world. The joint NASA Air Force research program is aimed at studying problems associated with propulsion, in-flight stopping and restarting of engines, heating and structural dynamics. Information obtained from flights of the YF-12 will be used to further the development and operation of future civil and military aircraft and the proposed space shuttle. As jet planes have increased in size and power, a problem recognized as a hazard for many years has become more critical, vortices, tornado-like patterns of air generated in the wake of planes. Because they are invisible, the swirling air masses are especially dangerous to lighter aircraft taking off or landing behind large jets. Recently, engineers from NASA's Langley Research Center conducted tests at the Hydronautic Ship Model Basin in Laurel, Maryland. They used a 300-foot-long tank filled with water to study the vortex problem. 
These tests are unusual because until now, the research had to be done on full-sized airplanes flying at low level past smoke towers. A six-foot scale aircraft is used for the tests as strategically placed nozzles on the model shoot dye into the water simulating air currents, cameras record the event for future analysis. This type of research very closely duplicates the vortex problem, allowing engineers to make many measurements under controlled conditions and do it inexpensively. In the next film, NASA is concerned with the issue of runway safety. Various tests are made in hope of preventing skidding accidents caused by bad weather conditions. After that, the second film gives us a further look at NASA's progress on the supercritical wing. This plane is making numerous landings in the interest of safety. It is part of a joint NASA-FAA Air Force effort to improve jet landing safety during bad weather. Well, we hope to prevent airplane skidding accidents on wet or slippery runways that are slippery from snow or ice. If we can estimate aircraft performance and tell the pilot what the slipperiness condition is, if the runway is too slippery to operate on for those uh, adverse weather conditions, we can dispatch the airplane to an alternate airport or have the airplane wait until the runway condition is safer and let, them in, let the airplane land safely. Uh, we hope to prevent airplane skidding accidents. The dry landing stopping distance of every type plane has to be certified by the FAA. Using this known figure, the recently completed research program is attempting to predict how long it will take jets to come to a stop on wet runways. Landing studies have been made at six airports around the country, from California to New York. Used in the test program is an automobile equipped with a diagonal braking system to help control it when the wheels are locked at high speed. Another friction measuring vehicle measures side forces. During a typical test, the car accelerates to 60 miles per hour, hits the brakes locking a diagonal pair of wheels, and slides to a stop on the dry pavement. Then the vehicle that measures side forces travels down the runway. Finally, the 727 itself lands and breaks to a stop. As the airplane takes off and prepares to land again, water trucks flood the runway. The jet now lands on the wet surface. NASA project manager Walter Horn explains how the data is brought together. Well, our, our research shows that if we take the wet to dry stopping distance ratio we obtained with a car, and compare this with the wet to dry stopping distance ratio for the aircraft, uh, when we've made these tests on a runway like this one here under wet and dry conditions, we find that these ratios are the same or approximately the same. Therefore, uh, we can go out on any runway, measure the wet and dry stopping distance ratio of the car, and predict what the aircraft wet stopping distance will be by means of this ratio. Airport runway studies, aviation safety on the ground. NASA has proved the effectiveness of an experimental wing after 27 test flights. Called the supercritical wing, the new design will have an impact on practically all jet aircraft of the future that fly at the speed of sound, 660 miles per hour. The supercritical wing was developed through wind tunnel studies by Dr. Richard T. Whitcomb at the Langley Research Center, Virginia. The refashioned wing is flat on top and curved on the underside at the rear. The new shape weakens the shock wave that normally builds on top of conventional wings during flight. The end result? A jet can fly faster without any increase in power and with less fuel. It is 1972, and the concept of planes that can take off and land like a helicopter is still very much a part of the NASA game plan. The first film that we see illustrates this. Then. The second film gives us a taste of how NASA performs its high-altitude Earth surveys. This is the jet-powered X-14, a test aircraft being flown at NASA's Ames Research Center near San Francisco, 
Although it looks like a conventional airplane, it can take off and land straight up and down. One of the men who flies the X-14 at Ames is test pilot Ron Gerdes. It's different in that it is a VTOL aircraft, and that stands for vertical takeoff and land. This aircraft can take off and land vertically by the thrust provided by two jet engines. This, and it can hover just like a helicopter can. Now, the thing that makes it different is that it is a research vehicle. We can vary the way this aircraft responds to its controls and thus do some basic research on VTOL control systems. You also might note that we have an open cockpit in this airplane. It's probably one of the few open cockpit jets flying today. NASA is doing research on vertical takeoff and landing planes like the X-14 to study problems associated with a workable intercity transport system for the future. Nearly every day, high-altitude Earth Resources Survey planes fly picture-taking missions from NASA's Ames Research Center in California. Operating at an altitude of 65,000 feet, these high-flying surveyors have photographed the U.S. from coast to coast, everything from blighted cornfields to water pollution. Their sensitive cameras are proving useful in detecting a broad range of agricultural and environmental problems. For a typical mission, cameras and film are loaded into the underside of the plane the day before the flight. When the mission is completed and the plane is returned, photographic technicians cap the cameras and pull out the various film rolls for processing. The films are then taken to the data laboratory where photo interpreters analyze the photography in terms of cloud cover and overall quality. Recently, the state of Washington requested NASA take infrared photos over their Blue Mountain area to try to determine the extent of tussock moth damage there. Last year, 430,000 acres of trees were damaged in Washington and Oregon. So devastating is the insect that the trees they attach themselves to usually die. Rick Johnsey, a forest entomologist with the Washington State Department of Natural Resources, describes some of the tussock moth damage as we flew over Walla Walla, Washington. Now, along the ridge here, again, you can see some pretty heavy mortality. And you can see, you notice the top of the tree begins to fade first. This is because the larvae, when they hatch out, they move up the tree and begin defoliating from the top down. The Douglas fir tussock moth is a rather host-specific insect. It prefers Douglas fir and truth firs, such as grand fir and silver fir. The primary host tree in this area would be grand fir. Some of the trees that you see that are green and have not been fed on are probably larch and ponderosa pine that are not preferred host trees. This area near Walla Walla was so badly infested by the tussock moth that the trees are having to be cut and hauled away. We asked NASA to fly this area where we knew there was tussock moth damage. Going Bob to occur. Scott is remote Before sensing coordinator for Washington State's Department of Natural Resources. He is interested in all views of Washington's timberland, whether taken at low level, high altitude, or even Earth Resources satellite imagery. Although a complete analysis has not been done, we asked him if he was optimistic that pictures like those from the high altitude survey plane would be helpful. Absolutely. I believe that the, the combination, the, the multi-stage combination of the satellite imagery, the high altitude uh, air photos, and the medium and low altitude air photos, uh, this whole multi-stage system uh, is, is going to be a great help in uh, evaluating how much damage there is and in, and in showing us what we have to do to uh, cure this, to uh, get rid of this infestation. High altitude surveys, a look at our Earth's resources from a different angle.
This final film is a good indication of how nature can help aeronautical researchers in their work. In this clip, NASA explorers are studying the wings of an owl. By doing this, NASA hopes to find clues that could lead to the development of a quieter jet aircraft. These jets landing at a large metropolitan airport may one day do so a lot quieter because of this small creature, an owl. When we examined the wing of an owl, we found that there was a serrated or a, a fine comb of feathers on the leading edge which pointed forward into the flow. And this comb or serration of feathers was the thing that we copied out of metal to form a, a rake which we placed on the leading edge of a, a rotor blade. And by simply copying this serrated feather, we found that we could indeed reduce the noise of a small rotor model, even though at that time we didn't understand how, how it uh, worked. That started a series of research projects to uncover the aerodynamic and the acoustic effects of serrations on reducing noise. Paul Soderman is an engineer with the Army Air Mobility R&D Lab at NASA's Ames Research Center in California. If it turns out that the serration does reduce the noise of uh, fan noise of jet engines, it would mean that the approach noise of aircraft approaching airports would be reduced, and it would mean less of a whine that people would hear as, as aircraft approach airports. Helicopters present a different kind of noise problem, especially as the helicopter blade slaps the air. Sawtoothed rotor blades appear to be a promising way of reducing this noise also. Many future tests will take place in this 30 by 20 foot soundproof room. Walls, ceiling, and floor are covered by foam wedges. And these wedges absorb the sound such that there are no reflected sound waves from the walls, and we can make acoustic measurements in the room without worrying about contamination from reflected noise. It's the same as going on into, into free space and, and measuring noise, but now we can do it in a laboratory condition. From the wings of owls may come the ability to make tomorrow's airport a quieter place. It would seem that we can now safely conclude that NASA was advancing steadily in their aeronautical technology. Their research paved the way for quieter, faster, and safer jet aircraft in the future. On our next show, NASA's research takes us to the mid-70s. We take a look at some different areas of aviation. Hang gliding and underwater research are two of the various topics we discuss. Till then, I'm Jim Burnett.